HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman, hosted by Carl Franklin. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 116, recorded live Thursday, June 5th, 2008. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik, RAD Controls, the most comprehensive suite of components for Windows Forms and ASP.NET Web applications. Online at www.telerik.com. And by the Code Better Blog Network, delivering tried and true solutions to real world problems for building better software. Online at codebetter.com. Support is also provided by .NET Developers Journal, the world's leading .NET developer magazine. Online at www.sys-con.com. In this episode from TechEd, Scott talks with Anil Nori and Murali Krishna Prasad from Microsoft's Velocity team about distributed caching. Hi, this is Scott Hansman, and this is another episode of Hansel Minutes. I'm recording live from the floor of TechEd 2008 here in Orlando, Florida. I'm lucky enough to sit down with Anil Nori and Murali Krishna Prasad from the SQL Server Group working on Velocity. Velocity is a new product that was announced here at TechEd 2008. Anil, what is, what is Velocity? Uh, Velocity is a distributed cache. Uh, it's primarily the goal is to really provide high performance, scale, and availability for applications. So this is a high performance cache that I can, I'm going to put my objects into this cache? What am I going to put into this cache? Yeah, you can put any kind of object in the cache. For example, you could put a CLR object or XML document or some blob or anything. The key thing is that, you know, it's no pun intended, but, you know, it needs to be identified by a key. So as long as you actually have an identifier, then you can identify it and then we can pull the data. So, so this is a giant distributed hash table. That's right. So this is a giant distributed cache, and the kind of the only requirement that we have is that the object be serializable so that we can store it across the machines. So in effect, we take a bunch of machines, we use the memory on all the machines and provide you the illusion of a single unified cache. So this sounds like the ASP.NET out-of-process session state service. It's similar to that, except that the fact that we can actually scale better by adding new machines, and your application need not be partitioned in any way. We can do all that stuff for you. Okay, so when I'm doing an ASP.NET application, which I think is one of the more common kinds of applications that would use a technology like this, uh, I, in the past, would use either out-of-proc session state or SQL Server-based session state. That is correct. Out-of-proc session state really just is one service. It's a Windows service that runs on one machine, and uh, there's no way to cluster it or, right. or spread it out. That is correct. So, in fact, one of the shortcomings of the out-of-state proc is the fact it runs on a single machine. So if the machine goes down, you lose your services, right? And you would have to manually partition it if you needed to. Whereas with this distributed caching technology, you get actually two benefits. First of all, we provide an automatic session state provider. So if you just change your ASP configuration to point to us, mm -hmm. we then take care of putting your sessions into the distributed cache and scaling your session state completely and also making it fail safe. So one of the reasons people put things in SQL Server is because they don't want to lose their state, right? And with the distributed cache, you get the in-memory kind of performance of it as well as the failure, uh, the failure, fail-safe things that SQL Server provides. Right, because everyone wants to use the out-of-proc SQL Server stuff, but we always say, I don't want the performance hit. Yeah, not only the performance, even with SQL Server, the fact that, you know, as soon as you have a lot of concurrent users really hitting the ASP.NET application, so then, you know, you have actually the scale and then, you know, that those kinds of problems. And the other problem is that in case if SQL Server happens to go down, then you have actually availability issues. So I have seen actually a lot of customers using SQL Server with Service Broker and then, you know, pushing those things to go to other SQL Servers. So they're sort of building some kind of a distributed SQL Server pro you know. And yeah, it's very difficult. Very when I was working in banking, we were building, we had to think about availability, we scale them out, we had failover. It was, we ended up building a, a little mini product to do distributed caching, and that's not the business that we were in. We're in banking. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think we are looking at actually latencies, which are almost like, you know, probably order of magnitude better than actually what you can hit SQL Server. Because we are looking at two to three millisecond, you know, latencies as opposed to like twenty millisecond access that typically, you know, you get it in your database systems. Wow! So okay. that's the other big benefit that you get with all the ASP.NET applications can leverage that benefit. So. 
So one thing, one other thing to add is it's not limited to just the session state. We can also, we have the caching API, so you can use that to actually cache any of your ASP data as well. So this is very similar to if people are familiar with the system web caching or the enterprise caching block, our APIs are very similar to that. So your application can kind of use our APIs and you can now scale your apps as well that way. So what does this look like exactly? Let's say I've already got an existing web server. Let's say that I've got 10 web servers in a farm and I'm using in-process session right now and I use the Mm system.web.caching. And because I'm using in-process session, let's say that I've set up what's called node affinity. So I'm trying to force people to stay on a particular node. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that happens with node affinity when web servers is that you end up having a pile up where you've got too many people on a certain node. That is correct. That's a scale problem and I'm now reaching the point where I'm going to need more servers even though they're not all working effectively. That is correct. What do I install to make Velocity speed up that scenario? Yeah. In fact, precisely the distributed caching Velocity can help you in this scenario. Okay. Because the moment you put the caching tier in behind for storing your session data, you don't have to have sticky routing or node affinity to your web servers anymore. You can actually hit any of the ASP uh, nodes, and they can, since because it's a distributed cache, all the ASP nodes can see that session data. So in, you, can, you can scale your sessions that way. And all you have to do is first install Velocity, obviously, in the caching tier, and then you just have to change the configuration in ASP session state provided to point to Velocity and give a uh, uh, pointer to one of the nodes in Velocity so that we can uh, talk to the cluster. That's all that needs to be done. No code change the caching necessary. tier, do I need more machines, or can I put them on the web servers as well? You can put them on the same tier. The only requirement is, obviously, you need to make sure you have enough memory on the machines, right. a little bit computing power. We don't use a lot of CPU, but we need some computing power, and mm-hmm. the network. You've got to make sure that we, you have enough network uh, capacity available on your network card. I, I actually think that, conceptually, there is going to be a caching tier emerging, you know, in the multi-tier stack. Yeah, I think that in the in the memcached space and the open source space, people who use things like memcached, scale out software, Alachi soft, the, um, serious caching definitely requires machines dedicated to doing yeah. just that. Well, to me, actually, caching tier can be physical or logical. Really? You know, in the sense that if it is logical, then you would actually mix it with your, you know, web servers. Mm-hmm. You don't need to really have separate physical, you know, boxes that we can actually support that configuration. Or you could actually have a physical tier which actually dedicated boxes with lots of Mm -hmm. memory and, you know, you can put actually caches in that caching tier. As you specify, depending on, you know, how high-end your application is, you may choose one or the mm-hmm. other. Right, every application scales a little differently. Some applications may be putting a great deal of small objects into a cache, while others may put large objects, one or two. Yeah. I think with, there, is other, there is other kinds of data. Um, let's say not session state, but, you know, more... You know, more read-only kinds of data. Right, data that might be shared not on a session basis, but uh, information like mortgage rates that's being shared throughout the application. For those kinds of configurations, we also actually allow you to have an embedded configuration where you know, you can actually have the cache sit in your app domain. And in process. In process. And since data doesn't change that often, we don't need to really synchronize that much you know, between these application processes. So you can, you're saying that you can tell Velocity that this information is not necessarily needed to be updated at real time like a session state might need to be? Yeah, you can configure. You know, we have a notion of uh, named caches mm-hmm. where you specify a name for the cache and then you know, a bunch of nodes you know, that actually participate in that. Interesting. And That's then, a very common scenario with system.web.caching, except I have to go and fetch the data for each of my 10 nodes. If I have 10 web servers and they all have a little in-process cache, That's right. I do still have to retrieve it 10 times. Yeah. You hear, hear, well, here basically what happens is that as soon as you say this named cache spread across you know, these five web servers mm-hmm. and you will say it's a replicated cache. So as soon as you put one page in one of these, we would automatically propagate it actually onto the, all the other you know, web server processes. Your application can read it as if it's a local cache to you. So that way you get actually nice read scale. Mm-hmm. So I could, this brings us kind of nicely into the types of caches we support. Okay. So we really have two main configurations of the caches. One is called the partition cache. Okay. And what that means is that if you take a bunch of machines and you give us a bunch of key value pairs, we will distribute it across the machine set, across the cluster. Okay. So what that gives you is the ability to kind of scale up on your data volume and your, read re- and your requests as well across the machines. 
So if you have one gig memory on 10 machines, you get effectively 10 gigs to cache. Right. The other option that Anil was just explaining is a replicated cache model where if you have a lot of requests for a small amount of data, you want to copy the data over to all the machines so that you can get faster access to them. So those are the two main kind of uh, cache types that we have. Mm -hmm. And there's another option in the partition cache is if you have a cache tier separately from your client, if you're frequently accessing some objects, you don't want to take the hit of the network overhead and the deserialization serialization. So we also have the notion of a local cache that you can keep in your client. It's like the L1, L2 caches that we have in processors. Ah. So you had said before about, um, about the idea of a, either a logical or a physical caching tier. In my experience with distributed caching products and third-party products, I've had to set up uh, multiple network cards. So, for example, if I was going to put the cache on the same web server that's serving pages, one network card is external and is serving the pages outside, you know, to the, the reverse proxy and on. And the second network cards, basically a separate backplane is, is put together only for the purpose of the caching to chat between themselves. I certainly wouldn't want my, my replication of the cache to be happening on the same subnet uh, that's being served to the outside world. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, uh, that is kind of correct. Uh, but it also depends on the cache configuration. Right? Okay. If you have a replicated cache... Yes, there's going to be a lot of data transfer because any change to one of the caches is going to affect the other caches. Okay. But it also comes with, are you going to change your data very frequently or not? The way we have set up our caches is that we don't, we're not that very chatty. The, if the caches are not, if there are no, not much updates happening, the caches don't necessarily talk between themselves other than to make sure they are alive, right? If you have replicate, if you have a lot of writes happening mm -hmm. to the cache, or if you have replication, um, a lot of, uh, if you have a replicated cache setup, then yes, you would probably need a separate network card if your web server I is see. taking so up all the traffic. So if it's write once or write occasionally, read often, the network traffic is not that chatty. The network traffic is not that chatty. That is correct. And certainly, if I'm writing to a cache a great deal, I might want to ask myself when it begins to thrash: Do I really need a cache, or do I need another? Precisely. Kind of, uh, model? Precisely. Precisely. Okay, so what exactly is this? You had said I could store this in process in an in a app domain. So there's some DLLs that get loaded, and there's a namespace that I can refer to. Yeah, that's correct. So it's basically, we, we, view, we view Veracity to be hostable in many hosting environments. ASP.NET is one example. Mm -hmm. It could be IAS, you know, so you're not really running ASP.NET. For example, you know, you may be running a PHP application, and then, you know, you may want to really have a PHP application, you know, accessing the client also. So really, any application so, that can talk to the CLR. So I could use Iron Ruby and anything Ruby on yeah. you know, Iron Ruby on Rails yeah. and talk to the thing. So it's there just is a, a client library. component for Velocity. Okay. And so you all you really need is there is a client component that you would actually include it actually as part of your app. Mm -hmm. And there is a runtime component. In the case of embedded case, you know, the runtime is also running as part of your process. In case of cache service, the runtime actually is running separate tiers. So this is very modular. This is something I can run server and client together, or I can move them away. Yeah. I mean, in fact, the architecture, you know, if you have time, you can go into more details. That oh, is, we have time, my friends. <laughs> so, so is even internally, you know, all the distributed components are highly modular. You know, for example, we actually see that, you know, there could be, you know, low latency networks, and then there could be just vanilla, you know, our TCP IP, you know, my Ethernet, you know, internal local networks. So we can actually layer our availability framework, availability platform on top of, you know, different kinds of really underlying, you know, transport protocols. Mm -hmm. So we have done it, we have uh, architected in a fashion that we can plug, you know, different kinds of transports. Let me add to that, actually. That's a very good point that he's bringing up. So we have a separate transport layer which abstracts out, as he said, TCP, IP, InfiniBand, or any other kind of uh, transport. And the availability itself is also isolated from the transport itself so that we can actually layer it on any kind of clustering technology that we have. Mm -hmm. And uh, and, the, and about that also are other parts of the architecture, including our data manager, the object manager itself is modularized so that you can plug in different, like if you want transactions, you can have a transactional kind of object manager plugged in. Right, right now it's an in-memory object manager. You can have a different kind of object managers plugged in to give you different functionality, so that you don't take the code hit of like one big gigantic monolith code block that does every possible thing. Right? Do you think that the way that you guys are running this is representative of kind of a new openness at Microsoft? Because I'm hearing things like modular, extensible, and I've personally been in meetings where you guys have been meeting with like the ASP.NET team and the IIS team. Uh, you're not necessarily. I mean, I just think this is cool because you're not building this in a vacuum and then coming out with it. You're making sure that that it works with SQL Server, it works with IIS, it works with ASP.NET. 
do you feel that there's a culture change that's enabling you guys to do this, or is this just what made sense to you when you started the project? No, I think that there is some sense of you know culture change that I see. Part of it is because you know, for me and my personally, you know, I came to Microsoft five years ago, and I worked in the industry, you know, doing different kinds of technologies, and I worked with different kinds of customers. You know, you hear different customer point pain points, so I view things you know from their perspective. So you still remember what it was like on the outside. Exactly. You know, I actually worked in a database, you know, building database systems. Then I went and built apps. Then I realized how painful, you know, using database systems were. Yeah. You know, then you'll end up actually building some of these caching kind of infrastructures. Now I have an opportunity to go and build it in a fashion that applications can actually use them, you know, more painless fashion. Mm -hmm. And also, I'm a big believer that, you know, there is lots of heterogeneity of, you know, is they exist. And then we need to go and then actually embrace that rather than walk away from that. Very cool. And one of the things that I wanted to talk about, you know, we mentioned about the modularity. So it's not in V1, but post V1, we are really planning to put a much richer data manager in the cache mm-hmm. so that you can run link queries directly. Link over distributed object Exactly. Cache. Link over distributed objects. Wow. And you heard it here first. That's cool. Yeah. And 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 the, the way the reason is that you know it's very natural. Already we are seeing people are saying, yeah, I can do this key based access. Oh, can I actually do you know tag based access? Can I actually order those things? Mm-hmm. So the people are really already asking, little bit or you know little bit by little bit, but you know richer database functionalities. So query is a natural thing that we want to support it. Mm-hmm. And as soon as you really say you know I want to support query, guess what? The objects are actually scattered across multiple boxes, and you don't even know where they are. So we have to really run, you know, distributed, you know, federated, you know, queries. Mm-hmm. And we have, you know, other projects that we are working on, really building very lightweight, modular, you know, storage engines as well as, you know, query engines. So that we want to integrate those things with, you know, Velocity. Okay, we're just going to take one second and thank our sponsors. We're going to come back and hear a little bit more about Velocity. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman with a word from our sponsor, Do you know how to build Web 2.0 AJAX applications with Web 1.0 components? You really can't. If you want to do the next-generation web applications, you'll need next-generation components, just like the ones that our friends at Telerik have got. They're rad controls for ASP.NET AJAX. It's a huge pack of web controls built on top of ASP.NET AJAX that'll add previously impossible performance and interactivity to your next project. The new controls mirror the AJAX API from ASP.NET, so development is really straightforward. The client scripts are shared, so loading time is not a problem. If you just set a couple of properties, and you'll be able to automatically bind to web services for a really efficient operation. The new RAD editor from ASP.NET AJAX Telerik loads up to four times faster than before, and the new RAD grid handles thousands of records in just milliseconds. But, as always, it's best to try for yourself. So you can visit telerik.com slash ASP.NET AJAX and download a trial. Thanks a lot. This week's Hansel Minutes is brought to you by CodeBetter.com, the CodeBetter.com blog network. It's made up of over 20 industry leaders and speakers who are passionate about delivering tried-and-true solutions to real-world problems for building better software. These guys are not only our sponsor this week, but they're also my friends. The CodeBetter blog network, it's where industry leaders blog. You can find them at CodeBetter.com, as well as Devlicious, D-E-V-L-I-C-I-O dot U-S. So we're back talking about velocity, and MK, you wanted to add something? Yeah, so one more thing to add when we talked about the modularity is that the whole velocity clustering technology is actually built, and we share it with the SQL Server data uh, data services technology. You may have heard about it, which is the SQL Server in the cloud, and which can host SSDS, SSDS, that's Mm -hmm. right. And that can host pretty much thousands of machines and run... At that, that was my next question because uh, it's easy to say that you can do caching on one machine or ten, but then you start talking about orders of magnitude and things get a lot more interesting. Right. So that's where, in fact, the interesting thing was that we partnered with them early on to make sure that we don't build yet another thing and then we kind of reuse the stack. And it has helped us in many ways that we've we've been able to sort of bring it bring the SSDS kind of technology as an enterprise product, mm-hmm. and we now have the clustering technology that can help us scale now to thousands of machines. So how has SSDS uh, stretched you guys maybe a little farther than you thought? Was there anything when you, when you started using, when they started using you, I assume that uh, they broke you at some point, and you must have 
Right. So there were interesting things, right? SSDs is a service. Mm-hmm. So you don't need to build all the kind of the fancy tools. So you don't need the fancy administration um, APIs because you can write Perl scripts or you can write other scripts to manage them. And the second thing is when you build that out to large scale, you can make some assumptions like, hey, I'll have a master cluster that's running somewhere, right? Just separate from my rest of the data cluster. Mm-hmm. But if you have to scale it down to like three machines, you can't say I'm going to have a separate master cluster that's kind of controlling these three machines. So those were some of the interesting challenges that we kind of brought about. And it was a very good kind of interaction where they were able to scale down their technology and we were able to kind of scale up our technology. So it kind of worked both ways. Interesting. And do you have a sense of when, uh, how big it can get? I mean, I'm sure there's, you've done the math. At some point, you figured out how the thing scales. Uh, is there a limit to how big something like this could get? Uh, and what would the what would the first bottleneck be if you started going thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands? Would the bottleneck be at the network? You know, or you know, what, where would you stop? Yeah, actually, one of the current bottlenecks, for example, that we know about is some of the routing uh, routing infrastructure because we have routing tables in the client. Mm-hmm. And that's something we're working on to make it much more kind of flexible and scalable because if you, uh-huh. once you get into 10,000 nodes, you don't want your clients to be hitting 10,000. You don't have to have whatever. You're going to have gigantic routing tables, right? You don't want that. So those are some technologies that we're working yeah, that's on. That's exactly what happened to us at my at my last job. We worked in in banking. We we, we had we moved our routing from a centralized route, which was a single point of failure, mm-hmm. to client side route, and then every client had to keep track of all the nodes that were a, a right. member of this thing. And then suddenly, you know, you get into a hundred of those, and right, right, you know, exactly, it, it's a lot more complicated. So we have some interesting technologies to kind of have at least slices of the routing table being updated, and also some sort of complaint-based updates and all that. So that we don't flood the back end to just say, "Oh, give me the routing table, give me kind of all that stuff." That's one thing we're looking at. And the other interesting things also come in the geo distribution. Mm-hmm. Those are some things we're working on to say, "Hey, if you want to have multiple caches spread across, if you have ten thousand nodes, presumably they are across the cluster, across the country." So how well to kind of coordinate those caches. Now, when you're building something like this and designing it, are you doing it in a protocol non-specific way? Because as you're starting to describe these things, I'm thinking to myself, well, they could use DNS or they could use, you know, there's different TCP specific things that one could use that have solved some of these problems of like a routing table. But then you wouldn't be able to plug in different things underneath. Yeah, we, we're definitely, you know, doing it in a protocol agnostic fashion. So that we do want to really plug into, you know, different mechanisms. You know, for example, that it's not quite relevant, but sort of relevant is how do you really bring, you know, data into actually the cache itself, you know. So we are looking at different kinds of really synchronization techniques. Mm-hmm. You know, we are working with the our, you know, sister projects you know, in the group, which are looking at Microsoft Sync technologies. They are, they are doing synchronization across, you know, variety of, you know, protocols and then, transport technologies. So we will be leveraging those guys. So I only worked at Microsoft for, what is it now, eight months, and uh, it's so big, and there's so many different projects. I feel like if I spun up my own project, that uh, inevitably someone would be doing the exact same thing. Now, you're in the SQL, you're in the SQL Server Group, or they call it That's Data correct. Services? That is correct. The data Platform. How do you make sure that someone's not thinking of the same ideas in some other group or in Microsoft Research somewhere? So Microsoft is a large company. So obviously you're going to have multiple people or multiple groups building similar technology. And distributed caching is not new. There are multiple projects that are going on which have built this. So one of the things that we are trying to do is to sort of work with the different groups, understand the pain points, and see how well our technology can kind of fit in the stack. For example, we've talked to MSN uh, Live. Uh, they have distributed caching technology. We are trying oh, to like see MSN. how... MSN.com and MSN. Live.com. and Live.com and, um, and others. And we are trying to see how well our cache can fit there and what can we help them out with. Like if you give better administration tools, for example, and things like that. And also, as we said, better integration with the rest of the stack. Like ASP.NET, we integrate better with them. Mm-hmm. So it kind of makes it natural uh, for people to start using this cache. So you'd like this to be built in at some point. This should be part of the whole base class library. It should be system.velocity or something. Yeah, probably. I think we would like it to be, you know, more ubiquitously used everywhere. And, you know, just to really extend the point that, you know, MK said talking to MSN, you know, very early on in the project, you know, not only just MSN, we went and talked to, we talked to research guys, we talked to connected systems division, we talked to developer division, because I see all of these guys as the, you know, consumers of a cache, Mm -hmm. you know. And we actually discussed quite a bit about, you know, is this an in-memory database or is this a cache? You know, well, what speaking are the of in-memory database, I remember that about 10 years ago, there was a Complus team at a thing called IMDB, and it didn't quite work out very well. 
Yeah. So, and in fact, people used to call velocity as an IMDb, and then people used to get confused about it, yeah. saying that you know why are you guys doing this? You know, we did it ten years ago. Mm-hmm. But the reality is that the whole industry and then the technology, the community has moved on. You know, ten years ago, IMDb's were done for different reasons than why I want to do things in memory now. Yeah. Yeah. So. It is an in-memory database. You know, eventually Velocity will be an in-memory database, but it's very different kind of in-memory database. It is not there to just accelerate SQL Server. Yeah. It is there to speed up your applications. Yeah, I think that's know, a really interesting point because if you look at the Facebooks and the Twitters and the big giant places that are struggling to to scale, uh, they are using you know memory caches to make it happen. I mean, a memory cache is becoming an almost required thing if you're going to take something to to internet scale. Absolutely. And even even from a technology perspective, you know, we are looking at not only RAM. You know, over time, you know, if I have actually Flash, you know, can I back this up with Flash? Because Flash, like or Flash NVRAM, RAM, yeah, NVRAMs. You oh, know, so that'll give you like you know, 64 gig, 128 gigs of actually you know NVRAM. Mm-hmm. And it will smoothly, you know, go from actually memory to flash rather than hitting the. Oh, disk. so like you were saying, L1 and L2 cache. You'd add an L3 cache, and you'd make you'd make ready boost for velocity. Absolutely, and so these are some of the projects that we are concurrently working on. Mm-hmm. So to me, these are technologies that are used everywhere, and you know, people expect them, you know, over time. Yeah. Are these big teams? When I, I mean, I'm, I've, I've talked to you guys over the last month or two about Velocity, but I've only ever seen you guys. I've only ever seen you two. Is it just you guys? Um, well, we actually do. This is another interesting thing that we do. You know, it's a distributed development. You know, <laughs> so so we have like three or four people here. We have like about fifteen people in India, mm-hmm. and so we partner with you know other teams elsewhere. So it's a completely distributed development. You know, I'm a big believer in. There's talent everywhere. Let's mm-hmm. go tap into those people. And it's a small group. So the total is about 20 or 20, 20 people. Uh, that's not very big, really. Yeah, more and more I've been seeing Microsoft embrace what Amazon used to call the two-pizza team. If you can feed the team with two pizzas, then that's the right size. Anything bigger than that, and it's too complicated. Uh, it's interesting. I think that people think that uh, when Microsoft comes out with a product, they have 100 minions that descend on the thing. And we have a lot fewer people than you think. Yeah, but one interesting thing to add is we get a lot of support. Like because part of the data platform, we get say marketing support. There's a separate team, or we right. get the product development support. Build so labs. We, yeah, exactly. So those are kind of the supporting technology which help a lot, right? So your individual team doesn't have to be that big. So you guys announced Velocity at TechEd. When can we see previews, and when can we start playing with this? Well, we have a CTP available right now. Okay, so we can download so this you, right now and start playing with yes. it. Yes, and. You know, we would love to really get more feedback, and you know, this is the right time for us to really shape, you know, velocity you know, based on the feedback that you know we get back, and then we plan to do another CTP, you know, for PDC, which is in October, mm-hmm. and then probably you know get it out by sometime early next year. Okay. You know, again, this is another thing that I want to really do is, you know, ship frequently so that you know we get more feedback, and this is you know we want to really preserve the compatibility, of course, so that. You don't have to really throw away your applications whenever we ship. So you, you anticipate know, someone should be able to download the CTP, take their existing application, and in an hour or so, start using Velocity and seeing if it makes a difference. Yeah, since we actually already announced it, people have already started doing it. Oh, you know, really? People have already put you know, blog posts, and then they said, oh, I downloaded it, you know, I ran it, and people are already using it, which is very gratifying. Where do you want the feedback to go? The Velocity blog? Yeah, so if you go to msgn.microsoft.com slash data, uh, we have the lost links there, so there are blogs and forum posts there. Okay. It'd be great if you can post requirements and what you find issues. Um, and I assume you're forum. watching the blogs to make sure if anyone blogs about Velocity, whether they're success or failure, then yes. you'll watch that as well. Yes, and in fact, we have these email alerts where if you don't answer a question in the forum within 10 minutes, 15 minutes, we keep getting emails. So we have all okay, those so the forums are, are definitely the place to ask your question, and you'll be looking at those yourselves. Absolutely, yes. absolutely. Fantastic. And, and some, some things to add is like the CDP1 itself right now, we have a cache service model where you have and the partition cache as the cache type. Mm-hmm. And CDP2, we're looking at availability and other some of the new functionality. So is there? A, I assume at some point you'll put a roadmap up on your blog to give an idea of Absolutely. the schedule that Anil was talking Schedules, about. Schedules, licensing terms, and other things. Very cool. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to sit down with me here today. Uh, and I'll be sure to check out Velocity. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, Scott. 
All right, this has been another episode of Handsome Minutes. We'll see you again next week. Bye.